this is a a program that we like to do a, a couple of times a year. We we cover different topics for it, and it's really geared for to to really help people understand how to to garden here in the South. It's to help out help out experienced gardeners perhaps who've moved to the South. Uh, it's a uh, can be a, a challenge uh, growing plants here if you're not used to it. If, if anybody is from Long Island, you don't need to type into the, the, the Q&A that when you lived in Long Island, you had six feet deep of beautiful loamy soil. I have heard that before. We have red clay. Uh, red clay is wonderful stuff. No, I joke. But with every, everybody, if, as we go through, use the, the Q&A to, to ask questions. We have a, a great, not only our speakers, but we also have some of our staff standing by to answer questions, whether it's about the program or about plants or about anything else. So I guess I should back up and introduce myself. I'm Mark Wethington. I am the director of the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Uh, I'll give a little bit of introduction to the Arboretum when I, when I begin my actual talk in a few minutes. As part of NC State, our, our mission, our goal is to, to educate people, whether they are college students, our, our first audience, but also homeowners, children, professionals. We do a lot of, of work with the green industry. And to our other goal besides education is to evaluate plants, find uh, the best ones, um, display them, uh, try to get them in people's hands. And, and really all of that boils down to we want to share our passion for plants. And, and that's really what it's all about. We love plants. We love gardening. We think it's an important way to, uh, to improve our world, and we certainly need to do everything we can to improve our world. And that's why not just our staff, but the speakers that we bring in, um, and you're going to find this out if you haven't um, heard Basil or, or, or Bryce uh, speak before, um, you're going to find out how much passion there is uh, all around us here. So, Really glad that that everybody could join us. It is a big group. It is, I think we had over 500 people registered. I know there may be some people who woke up this morning. It was nice and cool, and they had gotten a couple inches of rain over the last uh, day and a half and decided to play hooky and, and go out and get some hands-on gardening experience. Hopefully, they 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 turn their join us on their phone, stick it in their back pocket, and listen to us at least. I am going to, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get started if, unless any of the other panelists have anything they'd like me to add or anything I forgot. All right, I get to start early. Um, if you were, if you joined us very early, you'll, you'll have heard all of my staff laughing about whether or not I could actually keep a talk under an hour. So I, uh, I'm going to start five minutes early with my talk and that way uh, I don't have to I have a little more time to, to get through. All right. So I'm going to talk about plants that, you know, plants that live. Just do this Harry Potter things, the plants that live. You know, people always talk about, well, I have a, I have a black thumb. And the truth is, everybody has a black thumb when they start. The, the really good gardeners, I always say, just have killed enough plants to have really good compost, and that's when their thumb turns green. Gardening is a process. It, it always changes. So, but I'm going to talk about some of the toughest of the tough plants out there, ones that will really, if you try and grow these, you're going to be successful. First, for those who are 
perhaps new to the J.C. Ralston Arboretum and our programs and who we are, I want to just give you a, a real, give you the, the two-minute elevator speech. First question is, who was J.C. Ralston? Why are we named for him? J.C. was a professor here at NC State. He came in 1975 and started the Arboretum in 1976. He, part of his role as a, as a professor was not only to teach nursery production and plant materials, but to, to help grow the state's green industry, the nursery industry. And he had seen at various other places he had been that wherever you are, were in the United States, there were about 40 plants that made up 90% of, of what was available. So a different 40 plants in College Station, Texas than in Raleigh, but still everywhere, if you went to a garden center in the Raleigh area, you were gonna see almost the same 40 plants no matter where you went. And so he said, well, we need to diversify the American landscape. And so he started the Arboretum, planted things, see, would see how they grew and then would distribute them. And he really changed the face of horticulture. He passed away in a car accident, untimely, passing in uh, 1996. And in 2004, Horticulture Magazine commissioned this painting, a Heavenly Garden Party, the 25 greatest gardeners who had, who had passed away. And there's some that you probably recognize, like Thomas Jefferson, if you're, we had some people from, from out near Charlotte, you know, uh, Elizabeth Lawrence there, reading Homer. A lot of people in here you might recognize, but there's JC right here with his pruners in his hand. He was notorious for liberating cuttings from, from gardens and, and, uh, and propagating them, but he was, he was in return generous with those plants. He would share everything. Um, and we still maintain that, that ethos. And if you're a member, uh, we have a big plant giveaway the first Saturday in October. It's going to look a little bit different this year than normal, but, but we're still going to give away a lot of great plants. And so we still evaluate plants, but we try to do it in a ornamental, aesthetic sense. Uh, we don't line them, them out in rows. We, uh, we, we try and make beautiful gardens, but we are always looking for great performers to, to get to the hands of nurserymen. Now we are, we're part of NC State, but we're about 87% self-funded. So uh, we do that through programs, sales, Membership is our biggest, most reliable source of income. And even during this, uh, while our gates have been closed, membership has, uh, has really risen to the top in terms of importance for us. And our members have responded by, by really um, stepping up. And we've tried to respond to their needs by having a lot of programming and, and virtual events and, and plant sales and things like that. So how do we do all this if we're, we're um, self-funded? We do use students. We actually, this is a little bit misleading uh, because we use a lot of volunteers and not all, they're all young at heart, uh, young in spirit, maybe not young in years, they're just experienced. And they're great. The students are fantastic. I always tell people uh, our interns are uh, some of the, the hardest working, really smartest uh, folks that I'm ever around. Uh, I have two college age uh, children and the jury's still out on them. So I won't vouch for everybody, but the, the horticulture interns that we get at NC State have been really phenomenal, phenomenal students. And as long as you tell them what to do, they're fantastic, whether they're having a lab out here or, you know, helping us with a, a project, you just got to give them some clear direction and, and they can get it done. 
I do, I speak all over the place. Um, I give a lot of talks and I was in England talking to a, a very proper group of the, in the Royal Horticultural Society. And um, I put this slide up and dead silence. Apparently that translates a little bit different in, in jolly old England. Those ladies were not very jolly. All right, let's jump in. We're gonna talk about plants that you can't kill. The caveat always when I say that these are plants you can't kill is you have to get them established first. So when you plant something, you have to maintain it. And, and I think we're gonna hear a little bit more about getting things established probably from our other speakers, but in general, some, some good rules of thumb. You wanna dig a nice wide hole when you, when you plant a plant. You don't have to dig deeper because you don't want your plant to sink. You, you'd rather your plant to sit up a little bit high than to sit too low. Soil amendments are always great if you amend an entire bed. Don't amend a single hole. You're better off going straight into uh, red clay than you are to just amending a hole with, uh, with amendments. So amend, amend an entire bed, but not a hole. You can top dress with compost. And over time, if you do that yearly, it will start to really um, improve your soil. And make sure your plant stays watered, but not overwatered. So, so, and that really varies by what type of soil, what type of plant, what size plants. So it's hard to say. I know there are some rules of thumb out there, but I have found most of those rules of thumb to be not very, not very good. So plants, I'm gonna start with Perennials. Uh, now a perennial, when we're talking in, in gardening, when we talk about a perennial, we're talking usually about a herbaceous plant, non-woody plant, something without bark and wood that grows every year and comes back year after year after year. In botany, when we talk about a perennial, it's any plant that comes back year after year. So technically a tree is a perennial. But, but when we, we're talking about gardening, we're talking about a plant without wood. So one of the first ones, when I think of plants that are just tough as nails, is Baptisia. Sometimes it's redneck lupin or, you know, it's got all kinds of, of nicknames. And they're native here to the, the U.S., native to North Carolina. And the native ones, really, you have, you have white ones like Baptisia. Pendula and, and Baptisia minor, the blue, and there are some yellow ones. But they have been the subject of a lot of breeding and we've got everything from lavender ones like uh, purple smoke and one of my favorites, this, this soft buttery yellow uh, lemon meringue, cherries jubilee. When people name plants, they must be hungry most of the time because they seem to name them after food all the time. Baptisia screaming yellow. There really is just a, the colors are amazing what you get with Baptisia. So in the spring, they will sprout up almost like stalks of asparagus when they get started. Uh, depending on the selection, they will grow anywhere from about two feet to some get as tall as, as four feet or a little bit more. And they'll flower in the spring as the leaves are emerging. And, and so they flower above the, the foliage with these tall spikes of flowers. Gorgeous, gorgeous things. Now, after the flowers fade, you still have this mound of, of foliage, which just keeps a nice, tidy shape in the landscape as other things start flowering around it um, in the summertime. And then what, what I love about this in the fall you know, most perennials, you have to cut back to the ground. These, if you just leave them, they'll turn kind of grayish brown, and then all the stems will, will separate at the base by themselves. And if you just leave it long enough, the whole thing will blow like a tumbleweed into your neighbor's garden. Now, gardeners love these plants, but, but here's a secret. If you're a new gardener and you, you like the sound of this plant, when you go to buy it, you're gonna go to a store 
and you're going to get a plant and it's going to have one or two little uh, stalks in it. And you're going to say, you know, $15, $18, whatever for this thing, this, this is ugly. There's not much there. This is a plant that doesn't look good in, in a container. It just doesn't. But if you plant it, once it's established, this thing is there, will keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. Put it in a sunny spot to get the best bloom on there, although it'll take some shade. Deer usually leave it alone. Really, you just can't, can't beat it. It's, it's tough, but just keep in mind that it's not going to look, you know, like a knockout in the container, but it will in your garden. By the, the third year it's in your garden, it'll be one of the absolute stars in the spring. And there's still a lot of work being done. We had planted out a bunch of seed uh, here to see if we could find something really spectacular. Um, the field was spectacular. I don't think we had any individual plants that were that amazing, but incredible, incredible plant. Now another native to the U.S. plant is Amsonia or Blue Star. Now all of the Amsonias are pretty darn nice. But the, the, the one that really tops the list, most people's favorites, is the Arkansas Blue Star, Amsonia hubrechtii. This is another spring bloomer for, for sunny spot. It comes up with this nice wispy foliage and then gets loads of these uh, soft pale blue flowers. Uh, really kind of a nice, nice thing in the spring, nice uh, cool color. Over the summer, after it finishes flowering, it'll make a mound. It almost looks like if you know the little dwarf mugo pines, it almost looks like that. And so it's a really nice texture in the garden. But unlike a lot of perennials, in the fall, it becomes absolutely spectacular as well. It turns this bright, rich, buttery, butterscotch gold just with the sun starts getting lower in the sky and you get that, you know, that kind of warm late summer, fall sunlight hitting this thing, it just, it just, it just glows in the garden. There's no other word for it. Tough as nails. Unlike the Amsonia, you do after it, after the gold all goes and it turns brown, you just go in and you, you cut it back to the, the ground and, and wait for it to pop up next year. Now, peonies, peonies are tough, just in general. Peonies are very tough. Uh, you can go to old homesteads and, and house will be gone, and, but there'll be some daffodils and some peonies out there. The problem with peonies in the, the south, for the most part, is those big flowers open, it gets hot, and seems like 90 minutes later, they've already, petals have already shattered and, and fallen off. But there's a a group of, of peonies that are hybrids between herbaceous peonies and the tree peonies. Tree peonies can be a little tricky for us, but these hybrids are amazing. And the first one was one called Bartzella. And it is this gorgeous shrubby looking plant with these big blousy pale yellow flowers. We counted 80 flowers on our, our plant one year. I mean, just, just incredible. After it finishes flowering, it kind of just will stay there, have a nice presence in the, in the, the garden. They call these hybrids Ito peonies after the, the person who first hybridized these two different types of, of peonies. And Bartzella is the one you'll most commonly see, but there are plenty of other ones you know, mostly single flowered ones like, like uh, these two to fully double, double ones in, most are in pinks or yellows or kind of bicolors. And they're all just tough, tough plants and, and pretty long lived. Uh, the double flowered ones actually are showy longer because they have less chance of getting pollinated because some of the, the reproductive bits like you can see here, have been turned into petals and petaloids and things. So they, they tend to last a little longer in flower. But once you, you grow them, they, they just keep going and going and going. And uh, 
I, uh, I know I, at my house, I have one in a real prominent spot, this Bartzella, and I get a lot of walkers down. I'm, I'm at the end of a cul-de-sac and those walkers will, will stop uh, and kind of wait around till they see me outside to ask me what this incredible plant is. And we get the same thing here at the Arboretum. Now, if I told you orchids were among the toughest plants you could grow in, in the Southeast, you might think I was crazy. But the Japanese ground orchids, Blatilla striata, are really, really just rock solid, easy plants. The, the typical form has this kind of lavender pink color. I'm not good with colors, uh, so everything's, you know, I'm, I'm just one crayon box beyond uh, the primary color. So that's lavender pink to me, maybe has a different name. And there's white. Those are the two most common ones. But there's a whole range of them now. There's, there's yellow ones and there are ones with white edges to the, the leaves and uh, ones with white ones with pink lips on there. But whichever one you grow, they are absolutely solid in the garden. Now these are for shade. The, I, I was talking about sun perennials before, now we're going into shade. Um, these are pretty, these are mostly deer, um, I, I hate to say deer proof, deer resistant. They are very deer resistant. The foliage comes up, it looks like uh, little palm fronds when they start to, to open. They're kind of in this fan shape. Every once in a while the cold will nip them, well more than every once in a while. Fairly often the cold will nip them and you'll have some, it'll look like somebody cut the tips off with pinking shears. But as the leaves come up and are unfurling, the flowers come up and dance uh, above the, that foliage. After the, after the flowers, that, that foliage stays looking good until the end of the season. Great, and they molt, what's, what's really fantastic about them is you get one plant, you know, you get three plants and you plant them and they will multiply pretty quickly. And in just a few years, you'll have, uh, you know, nice full patches of them with lots of blooms. Uh, so they're, they're really easy and they pay off quite well in the garden. Now, another shade plant is Solomon seal, Polygonatum odoratum. And this is what Solomon seal looks like. You will almost never see this plant. Instead, what you find is the variegated form. This is one of the, the few plants where you see the variegated form more than, the, more than the, the solid green leaf form. So I'm really going to talk about this. Now this is a, a lovely woodland plant, and that makes that variegation nice because if it's in the dark, a kind of a dark area, you can really see those, those, flat, those leaves. In the spring, it flowers, and the flowers are very pretty but they're a little hidden under the foliage. You gotta, you gotta kinda wanna look for them, but the leaves are so gorgeous, it doesn't really matter. It will spread and will eventually form really nice ground covers if, if you let it over, over a long enough period, or if you wanna keep it contained, you just dig up a little piece and give it to a friend when they're visiting, and, and then when you go visit them and you see something really nice, you can say, oh, how's that Solomon seal I gave you? Oh, it's doing well, yeah, that's a nice plant right there you have. Solomon seal is another plant that you can get really good fall color on it often. Not every year, but the years that it does, it can be really stunning uh, with that buttery yellow. It's another one that, that deer tend to leave alone. Okay, another um, mostly deer proof plant is the sacred lily. Rhodia japonica, sacred lily. In Japan, they grow these in little pots and pay high dollar for them and spend a lot on them. But in the garden, they're just, they have these leathery leaves, very thick textured, leathery, evergreen leaves. So this one doesn't die back in the winter. It stays, stays green all winter. Has little inconspicuous, mostly inconspicuous flowers down near the base, but in the fall, it will, those flowers will, that get pollinated will turn into, you know, bright red berries, which are quite nice. Um, the berries, ants like them, and they'll, they'll move them a little bit, but they're not very far, and you tend to have 
build up patches in the garden of these plants um, slowly, but they will. There are all kinds of variegated ones and ones with twisted and curled leaves and ones that are variegated and twisted and curled leaves and ones with narrow leaves and all kinds of things. And if you get into them, you can really, you can spend a lot of money on, on these things if you like. But, but they really are fun and most all of them are just tough as nails. Now the Japanese who spend hundreds and thousands of dollars for individual plants sometimes, their goal is to get the most, the ones that don't live at all, the ones that try to die on you. Um, so you don't want those, but you know, most, most all of them I've found to be vigorous and easy in the garden. I've got two rambunctious boxers and they run all over my plants and things and, and my sacred lilies never have a problem. All right, we're going to move from, from the, the perennials to shrubs, and I'm going to start with a few evergreen shrubs. First one is, is Florida starflower or anise shrub. These are related to the star anise that you um, use, you know, as a, as a spice. Uh, that's a tropical one called Elysium verum. You don't want to use these as a spice. They, they are not good and can even be a, a little on the, the poisonous side. So no, as, no, don't use it as a spice. But Elysium floridanum, as the name suggests, uh, comes from the southeastern U.S. Perfectly hardy here. It makes a lovely evergreen shrub with these big red flowers on them in, in the spring. Strappy petaled flowers. One of the great things about this as an evergreen shrub is it is as deer proof a plant as you can get. It really is. It gets to be pretty big. Uh, if you don't prune it, I've seen Elysium floridanum eight, ten feet tall, six or more feet wide. It can get to be a big plant. It tolerates kind of any kind of pruning you want. Now, and it'll grow, and, and I say this for all the Elysium, it'll grow in sun or shade. I find if it grows in full sun, the leaves start to look a little pale green, kind of a, a light green. So in part shade where it's, it's, um, it's getting some sunlight, uh, where it, but not in, in full sunlight, the foliage gets darker and darker. So I tend to like it in, in a bit of shade. There are other ones. There's, there's, there's another native um, that we have, Elysium parviflorum, which has a very, very small flower. So as a flowering plant, not quite as effective. The Japanese form, uh, Asian form, Elysium anisatum, uh, has these white flowers. A little bit smaller typically than Floridanum, um, but still quite showy. And it, again, can form a big shrub over time but will tolerate pruning. Now, if you don't want something that big, NC State has one of the best plant breeders in the world up in the mountains. Dr. Tom Ranney and, and his team up there have, uh, they, you know, they looked at it and said, okay, we've got this evergreen shrub. It's a beautiful plant. It grows well, sun or shade. It's deer proof, but it's really big. We ought to make them smaller. And so they bred a smaller red flowered one. And this picture is for some reason, it's coming across pink. It really should be more red. That grows about four or five feet tall and wide called Scorpio and a white one called Orion. So it takes, you know, the best of, of both worlds, makes them uh, nice and small. And to top that off, they tend to flower more, uh, re they rebloom better than other Elysium. So you get flowers on and off throughout the season. The flower heaviest in the spring, but then we'll, we'll put out more flowers over the summer. And actually these pictures were taken in August. So you can see it really does rebloom well. There are some other forms, including one called Florida Sunshine that is a bright gold leaf form. That's pretty cool if you like something bright. It is a parviflorum, so it has a very small flower, and, but you know, who needs a flower when your plant looks like that in the middle of winter? Okay, perhaps my favorite plant in the world, 
is fragrant osmanthus or tea holly, or, or, or it's got about six common names, but osmanthus is, is as easy as anything else. It's a big evergreen shrub, usually with white flowers, and it is so heavenly fragrant. It is among the most fa fragrant plants you will ever, ever experience. My daughter says they smell like peach soda. She told me that when she was very young. Really easy, tough plant. I don't have problems with deer eating mine, but I don't want to make a, a too broad a statement of that. There is even better an orange form, variety Orantiacus, so orange fragrant tea holly. The, this variety tends to grow somewhat narrower and tighter than, than the white form. But the downside is it, the flowers don't seem to last quite as long either. It's very quick to come in and out of flower, but it's so worth it. This, this is the smell of fall to me. That's that just absolutely my favorite time of year uh, when the osmanthus are, are flowering. Another evergreen, tough evergreen, Japanese fatsia. And this is a great plant for getting kind of a tropical look in your garden. You get these big leaves on there, big palmate leaves on a slow growing evergreen plant. Not deer proof. As a young plant, you want to protect it because deer do really like eating this actually. But it's worth it because once it gets bigger, those leaves are so big, it's hard for them to really eat. In fall, like this time of year, they start coming into flower and we'll keep flowering into winter. Uh, which is great because, you know, we'll often have very warm days and the pollinators are still out working flowers. So, uh, and they love, they love the Japanese fatsia. Great for a, a, a shady spot. It'll grow, once it's established, it is incredibly drought tolerant. Just a, an all around tough, tough plant. I can't say enough about it. It's, it's one problem is it's very slow growing. So sometimes it's hard to find in nurseries because uh, it takes quite a while to, um, to really develop a, a plant. Now we'll go to some that lose their leaves that are deciduous. Another native, oak leaf hydrangea. Now not native to North Carolina um, really, but, but a little bit farther south, but it'll grow up into the mountains of North Carolina without missing a beat. This is another big, bold plant, great big leaves, kind of reminiscent of oak leaves. Hydrangea corsifolia. Quercus is oak, so it's hydrangea, oak leaf. And it has these nice, big, spiked flower heads in, in kind of late spring, early summer. Quite showy. And there are a lot of selections of this plant. So you can buy, find dwarf ones, you can find great big ones. They, as the flowers age, they turn kind of pink and then rose, and it can be very attractive. And you'll find some that have been specially selected to really go from the white to pink very quickly and have really, really saturated pink tones on them. Uh, so there's some that, that really they, they show that pink quite well. I've never come across a, a bad cultivar of oak leaf hydrangea. They've all been tough. The, the one thing with them is if they're dry or if it's really hot over the summer, the leaves will all kind of wilt down. But you come out the next morning, even if you haven't, if it hadn't rained or you haven't watered them, those leaves will perk back up. It's just, they've got so much surface area that when it's hot and dry, they'll, they'll kind of, Will kind of weep a little bit. In fall, you get great fall color, usually a really nice burgundy like this, but sometimes it's, it's shot through with brighter reds as well. And there are other selections, you know, for flowers, like there's the Snow Queen, which has these double flowers, which are really beautiful as they start changing to pink. And then ones like Harmony, which have really good double flowers on them that you know, these really dense, dense heads, not the, the kind of more open, elongated ones. 
but they're just, they're all wonderful, wonderful landscape plants. And if you like that yellow, like the Elysium, there's one called Little Honey, which comes out in spring, bright, bright gold, kind of goes more chartreuse over the, the summer, and then, and then can get some really amazing fall color uh, as well. You get the best color in sun, but it needs, to, it needs moisture to make sure it doesn't burn if it's in too much sun. It, it, if it dries out, the leaves can burn a bit. Another native, Itea virginica, Virginia sweet spire. You can see the, just these long spikes of white flowers. It's fragrant. I have a terrible sense of smell, so I've never really been able to smell much on sweet spire, but other people tell me it's got incredible fragrance. I don't know. I can smell osmanthus, but I can't smell this. Um, but the pollinators love it. It'll grow almost anywhere. Naturally, it grows in kind of wet spots. So if you have a spot that stays kind of damp, um, you can plant this there. It grows in sun or shade. It will sucker and form colonies. So, you know, you may not want it in a formal garden, but if you have a little bit more of a natural area or somewhere where you would like it to, to become, you know, really spread out, hold a, a bank down near a pond or something like that, it's perfect. And the flowers are wonderful, but a lot of times people grow it just for the fall color. And there are selections just for fall color. This is one called Henry's Garnet, but there are others like Saturnalia, um, which has more kind of more varied colors in there, you know, and, and other forms of you know, almost fire engine uh, red or orange in there. Really, it's one of the most reliable fall coloring shrubs for the, the southeast. It's native, it's good for pollinators, it'll grow in just about any condition you give it, including, you know, soggy spots. It's, it's a real workhorse of a plant, but beautiful as well. Another plant that seems to get overlooked a bit, uh, unfortunately, are the deciduous azaleas. Now everybody, it seems in the south, wants evergreen azaleas, you know, they, and, and they're, they can be beautiful when they're in flower. They're hard, some things are, are you can't beat in th those in a nice one in flower, but they can often have problems. They can be a little mythy, as the English say. They don't always look great, but we have these great native deciduous azaleas. Now, this is a picture taken on Grandfather Mountain of the flame azalea which loses all its leaves in winter, but then has these beautiful orange flowers in the spring. We have uh, the, the coastal azalea, the Piedmont azalea. So you see, they really cover from, from the coast to the mountains. You can, you can have it all. And there's been a lot of breeding with these, these guys. And the colors, the, how saturated these colors are, are just, they're, it blows me away that more people don't grow these. They tend to, most of them tend to start as young plants, as fairly, fairly upright plants. Over time, they'll, they'll spread out. A well-grown plant, the top of each of those branches will have a cluster of these flowers. They're salia, so they like to grow in, in some shade. They don't want very wet feet. Uh, they, like, they like ideally a moist, well-drained, acidic soil. But I grow them in, in, you know, fairly heavy clay soils just, just fine as long as I don't plant them deep. And the pollinators cannot stay away from them. After they finish flowering, you know, um, what I like to do is I grow smaller vines like clematis, smaller clematises and things through them and they form the perfect framework for that. So they'll flower with their, their azalea flowers beforehand and then later on in the season, we'll have another flower on there. Okay, we're gonna finish up with just a few trees. If you had to ask me for one flowering tree that was gonna be tough, you know, toughest tree you could get, I would probably say the Chinese fringe tree. It is amazingly urban tolerant. It'll take co compacted soils. 
it's when it flowers it is absolutely beautiful there are male and female plants the male plants are the showiest and these are this is a, a male flower they have the the showiest flowers um, but if you get a female you do get these little blue fruits so if you have both you can get the blue fruits and and sometimes you'll get a bit of fall color like this but not generally known for great fall color it seems like one out of every five or six years you'll get you'll get um, some pretty good color we do have a native fringe tree Cyanthus virginicus which is also a beautiful plant a little more airy and loose and delicate than the chinese fringe tree it's just not as tough it's it's a great plant I highly recommend it, but it's not as tough a plant. And I was going for, for this talk, the toughest of the tough. Another great one is the trident maple. This is an Asian maple. And what I like about this is not only is it very tough, it's used as a street tree on Glenwood South, which if you know the Raleigh area, you know that's where all the bars are and the college students are and things like that. So if it can survive, you know, the typical city conditions during during the day and then everything that drunk college student will do at night, you know, it's a tough tree. And what's great is it's not so big as like red maples and sugar maples. It's it's more, you know, in 20 years you're gonna look at you're really looking at a 35 to 35 or so foot tall plant. So it's, it's a little bit more in scale with smaller landscapes and can have great bark as well, but just, just really one of the toughest um, maples you can grow. Now, if you want something a little bit bigger than that, there are ginkgos, which are, this is one of the most primitive uh, of trees. So it's been surviving for a long, long time and uh, which, which makes it, you know it's going to be tough. They can be slow growing and if they're grown out from seed they can be very variable in shape. This is another one where there are male and female ones and this is why you always want to get a named cultivar of ginkgo. You don't want to get just a seedling ginkgo because the fruits on a female ginkgo tree they'll fall and they'll, they'll start breaking down the ground and they stink they are, oh, they'll make you sick to your stomach. They stink so bad. The, it, the seed inside, if you roast those, those are delicious, but man, I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to clean the fruits to get those seeds. Now, one of the, the best things about ginkgo, and this is something that I've heard one of our other speakers, Bryce Lane say many times, is you get this great fall color. I mean, always this beautiful gold fall color. But what's great about this, and if you've ever lived underneath a large oak tree, you'll, you'll really appreciate that, um, this, is that all the leaves fall off almost at once. The tree is beautiful like this. You come out the next morning and there's a skirt of, of a beautiful foliage, gold foliage on the ground underneath it. If you, you know, and with oaks and things like that, they, they sometimes are shedding leaves for, you know, three months. This does it all at once. And it is, it is just, just gorgeous. But always look for those named cultivars. Um, this is one Chi Chi. There's Presidential Gold and Saratoga Gold. Um, more recently, there are a bunch of really narrow ones. Um, there's some dwarf ones as well that are almost shrubby. So you can, you can really, um, even in a small spot, if you don't have room for a massive tree, you can, you can find these uh, different ones. Circidophyllum japonicum, Katsura tree. This is another tree that can get very, very large. Sometimes labels on it don't say quite how large it can get, but you know, in, in 20 years, you could be looking at a 50 or 60 foot tall tree if it's real happy. It has kind of these rounded, uh, somewhat rounded leaves. It's, it's just, it's a lovely tree all, all year round. Flowers aren't very showy. It's just a really nice plant. It's usually got a nice form. 
Fall color can be very, very nice, but what's really amazing about it, when you go out in the fall, when you get a nice cool dead morning, you know, after frost or, or close to frost, you'll get this, people describe it different ways, but to me it smells like sugar being turned into caramel, that, that sweet smell. Some people compare it to jelly, cotton candy, but it's this sweet sugary smell. You'll be walking through the garden and you'll smell it. Like, what is that? It just kind of drifts around kind of this somewhat elusive uh, scent. It's, it's great. On cold mornings, I make a point of, of going out in the Arboretum to go buy ginkgo because I, I mean, go buy Katsura tree because it's, it's such a cool um, fragrance. A few smaller flowering trees, uh, a tree that we're really known for here, the snowbell, Japanese snowbell. We have a large collection of them. They're beautiful plants. They flower later in the spring than like our, our dogwoods or red buds. So after the leaves come out, but whereas some trees that flower when the leaves are out, the, the leaves hide the, the flowers. Snowbell, the, the flowers hang down below the leaves. So you get almost like tiers of, of, of flowers. They're followed by little gray fruits, which are, uh, you know, they won't stop you at 50 miles an hour, but they're, they're nice. I, I like them as an ornamental feature. They look like little, you know, Christmas ornaments or something like that, or earrings hanging from the tree. There are a lot of forms of it. There's weeping ones like Carillon, Snowbell, and one that the, was introduced through the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, Emerald Pagoda, which is a little bit more of an upright plant than typical with very large flowers, much larger than the typical species. So extra showy. That's, that's one I believe, uh, you might get Bryce to tell you the story of, I believe Bryce put that name on it, Emerald Pagoda, in fact. There's some great new ones that are coming out, like this evening light snow bell, which has purple foliage and white flowers. It tends to be more of a, a, a smaller plant, a shrubbier plant, than the, just the straight species. But great color on there, beautiful when it's in, in flower. Another tree that we are well known for, we have a national collection of these. This is the, our, the red buds. Our native red bud grows out in the woods right here um, locally. If you live, if you're driving on 40 or 85, I guess, sorry, going through Greensboro, on the other side of Greensboro, west of Greensboro, there's a, a spot where every spring I try and drive through there just because I wanna go through what I call red bud alley that's just they're naturally growing red buds just lining both sides of the highway there that are gorgeous. I was, I was quarantining this spring, so I didn't get to go drive through there this spring. Red buds have these lovely little heart-shaped leaves, so beautiful during the, the, the growing season, very different texture than most other trees with those, those heart-shaped leaves. Uh, the Arboretum has introduced um, several with, with Denny Werner being the breeder, our former director. A couple of these are pink pom-poms, which have double flowers. They last much longer. And this is in the bean family, so they can form bean pods, but the double flowered ones won't uh, form bean pods. The newest ones from the Arboretum are Golden Falls. I missed the L on golden, I think. Uh, which is a weeping gold leaf form, and flamethrower, which uh, is this multicolored thing that comes out in burgundy and then goes coppery and then chartreuse. It's just a, a riot of colors, and you can see in production it is something else. It is, it is really spectacular. And this has become the most asked about plant in my home garden. All those people who walk down the street and uh, loiter around at the end of the, the cul-de-sac until I'm outside gardening. They all want to know what this plant is. So I'm going to finish up with just a couple of things. I, I mentioned that membership is, you know, really a critical component. Uh, it's, it's how we can offer a program like this for free, along with um, generous support from sponsors like Basil's company, Leaf and Limb. But 
membership, you get a lot of uh, great benefits, including uh, you get reciprocal privileges with other gardens, like 300 other gardens across uh, North America that you can go um, visit, our, our plant giveaway, plant sales and discounts on plant sales. Uh, just uh, there's a lot that you get with, with your, your membership. One that's probably one of the most important is you get discounts at garden centers and nurseries and restaurants and you know all kinds of groups have have special offers and discounts so it's it's really it pays the a membership pays for itself really like to thank basil and his team from leaf and limb they have done a tremendous amount of work for us. They, they bring the whole team out and will do work days for us. Everything from helping us with, you know, diseased trees and, and things we need to, to, to remove or we need to, we need to, you know, work on to, to save, to doing trainings for us out here. Just a tremendous amount, but they also sponsor this Gardening in the South series because they feel so strongly in, in education and bringing horticulture to people and just they share our passion for, for trees like almost no one else. So thank you all for, for joining us. We're going to take a 10 minute break, Chris, a five minute break. And then we'll be right back with uh, our next speaker. So five minutes, we're going to come back at 10 o'clock. So you actually have seven minutes. I, I finished early. I started early, but I finished early. Um, I, will, I will be here and while we have this, this uh, seven minute break, I will be happy to answer any questions that didn't get answered if I can. All right. Mark, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, so um, technically you didn't finish early because you started early. Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Technicalities. How on earth can anybody give a talk in 45 minutes? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know, I know. That was well done. Well, thank you, thank you. All right, trying to identify flowering plants and shrubs which are deer resistant for a shaded area. Whew. Well, like I mentioned, you know, the Elysium, the, you know, some of the ones I mentioned, Elysium and the, the Blatilla are, are great for that. Oh, I tell you what, whenever somebody asks this, I, everything flees from my head. If you go to our YouTube channel, we have a great YouTube channel, and uh, we have all kinds of, of talks and lectures up there, and we have one specifically on deer-resistant plants. I know that's, that's posted there, so if you, if you go there, um, you can get that. And on a related note, somebody asked if, if this was being recorded, and the answer is yes, it's being recorded, and you will all be given a link so you can come back and watch watch what you want to watch fast forward through what you want to fast forward through i have learned with with a, a child doing college online that you can in uh youtube you can speed up somebody so uh you can go to you know one and a half times the speed and uh you can get you get a lot going uh that way uh, let's see Yeah, bottle brush buckeye is a great one in shade. Uh, what clematis species do I use? I use a bunch. Um, they're in the clematis. Well, I take that back. There aren't many clematis that I don't don't really like. Two of my favorites right now are sweet cake, which is kind of a, a white, kind of bell-shaped one with a darker center, and 
and Lady Diana, which is another one of these almost like tulip shaped with the bright pink. But there are so many great ones kind of in any color you, you want. All right. Don't forget that you can you can go to jcra.ncsu.edu backward slash swag and you can get that book uh, a book on gardening in the south that I wrote you can get our our t-shirts and hats and things like that we've got a great 2020 covid related t-shirt you will have to you have to register on a, a site called clickbid to order that's just how we that, that's how we we do the payment and and things there there was a question about a uh, list, a written list. I, w I, I can create a, a list um, from my program, uh, from my thing, and I'll get it to Chris, and he can email it out to everybody who, who joined us. Uh, I find when I give a list that people pay more attention to the list than, than me. And this will be on YouTube, so you can, you can go back, and that way you can actually look at the plant and the name. Somebody asked what was the name of some of the variegated varieties of sacred lily. The most of them are in are Japanese names, but uh, there's a few that aren't. Piccadilly Pace. Uh, Rokumo. Oh, yeah. Oh, there, Dennis answered that. Sent you to Plant Delights Nursery, which is where we got most of our uh, Rhodia, so that is a good place to go. Oh, I got such a good team here. Oh, they're answering everything. And Rhodias are very drought tolerant once, once they are established or good for planting around trees and things like that. 